welcome to Mod Pod with Fuka Napa, a podcast that celebrates the strength and pulse of the luxury market. And now, here's your host, Vanessa Fukunaga. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mod Pod with Fukunaga. And today's special guest star is Kurt Bowman. Thank you for having me. Glad Thank- to be here. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Coming back to Cabo. Yep. <laughs> yep, I still get to spend a lot of time here, so I'm a lucky guy. Yes, me too. I yep. live here permanently. And you are the president of Mission Sports Agency. Correct. And Bowman Golf Design. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, in uh, 2016, I, I formed Bowman Golf Design originally. It took a little bit of courage, but decided to form my own company. And shortly after having formed that, uh, opened a distribution company down here and, and fortunate to represent some of the best brands in the golf business and service a lot of the golf courses in this market, many of whom are my, my closest friends. So uh, I'm lucky to do it in, in an area that I love and work around people that I like being around. And so, and, and in a place that's really been as much of a home to me as any place I've ever lived. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. So it's, uh, as you know, it's a special place here and it's a very close knit community. It is. Yeah. So I, I, I'm fortunate to be here and fortunate to still travel here. And one day I may find myself living here again full time, <laughs> but for the time being, I'm, I'm lucky to get to come back and forth. Well, that's great. And you know, when you want to move here full time, you also know where to go yes, for, I do. I <laughs> for some exa- real estate is I, all I'm saying. I know exactly. <laughs> I know exactly where to go. Yeah. So yeah, fortunate to know people like you and so many good people down here. And I'm sure we share a lot of common friends yeah. and uh, it's a very special place to me, to my family. My, my children were raised here and uh, we have a lot of great, so many great memories of, you know, my children growing up here, it's a, it's a neat place. Oh, that's nice. And today, as per usual, we are in La Boutica, who helps sponsor Mod Pod with Fukunaga, La Boutica in Las Ventanas, Al Paraiso. Have you been in La Boutica before? I have not. It's a, an incredible place and, and so unique, unlike any other place I've really ever seen before. So yeah, I'm, I'm honored to be here. And it's, uh, <laughs> Isn't it's it incredible. gorgeous? It's gorgeous. Oh yeah. my gosh, yeah. it's gorgeous now and it comes to life at night. I bet. Yeah, so I'd we'll like have to, see to come it. back. I'd like to see it in that environment. Yeah. <laughs> it'll it'll definitely come to life life for us. So you're the one that literally makes it happen. You're either taking new raw land or maybe outdated golf courses yep. and creating a, a new piece of art. How did you even get started in this business? Well, I started in it because I loved golf first and foremost. And by, by the time I had started playing golf as a, a young teenager, where, where I grew up, golf for high school was a, a sport that you played in the fall. And so your two choices were football or golf. And mm-hmm. I originally in junior high had played football. And at that time, even though I'm relatively tall now, I was short, but I was slow. And that's not a great combination playing <laughs> football. And so by ninth grade year, a lot of my friends had went out for the golf team. I started playing. I was never one of the best players on on my team. Certainly I was around some incredibly talented golfers growing up Mm -hmm. and, but I loved it. And I had a a passion for it. I I think that's very uncommon. And so then it was just trying to find my route into golf, you know, and and it could have probably been several things that I, I could have done in golf that I would have loved. Uh, I started in golf course maintenance originally, got a turf grass, a degree from uh, the Ohio State University, graduated from there in 95. And wow. the biggest break for me in that business was after working at a, a golf course in Ohio for a, a famous architect named Donald Ross had designed that. Mm-hmm. That really started piquing my interest in the design part of it. And when I enrolled at Ohio State, you had to do an internship as part of your your degree. Mm-hmm. And I asked my turf professor, hey, look, you know, where, where could I work? And he basically said, you can go wherever they'll hire you. So I said, I, I want to work at Augusta National. Oh. And at that time, nobody from my university had ever worked there. So in, in 95, I got an internship at Augusta National. And that was really a a kind of a turning point in my life. I mean, wow. I mean, it wasn't anything glamorous. I was mowing greens and spraying greens and sodding things, but it more than just what I learned during that time, it gave me belief thinking if I could work here, you know, I yes. might be able to do other good things. Right. Wow. So, so it was a pivotal, it was a pivotal, pivotal moment in my career. 
And I worked there, I still have ties there. Um, worked for a guy named Marsh Benson, who's really one of the iconic figures in, mm -hmm. in, in the golf business. And uh, I still return there to work at the Masters Tournament every year. And I, I talk about that golf course is though I've worked, worked there for 20 years or something. Uh -huh. I mean, the reality is I worked there six months. I did an internship. But because of that being young in life and such, such a formative period of life, it, yeah. it's, uh, there's pictures hanging all over my house uh, <laughs> of that golf course. I asked my girlfriend, a now wife of 27 years, to marry me on the 12th green at Augusta, which is one of the, the more famous holes in, in golf. I'm not sure anybody else has ever done that. Maybe, maybe it's been done there before. But um, so it holds a, holds a special place. Even my daughter's uh, dog is named Augusta. Oh, so, my gosh. So it, it literally generational. You know, so it's ha had an impact on her. So it's 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 a, a special place to say the least, and not just for me, but for so many people. That is really impressive, and just to yeah. say it, and to, to and where did you move on from there? So <clears throat> when I finished working there, I still had, I believe, two quarters left of school, and the decision was, do I go back? to work there when I finished college and my, again, my, I guess maybe it was my, yeah, it would have been my fiance by that time, she was living in Atlanta. So I took a job as an assistant superintendent at Atlanta Country Club, a very historic uh, golf course in Georgia. They held a PGA tour event for probably over 30 years. And so I worked there and it, it became clear to me, even probably after, even during Augusta, I, I wanted to figure out how to be in golf design, but you have to figure you know, how do you get in the business? Who do you talk to? You're a young person. And the architect that worked at Atlanta Country Club was a guy named Mike Riley, and he had worked for Jack Nicholas. Mm -hmm. And every time I got a chance, I'd beg him for a job, you know? Mm -hmm. And finally, one day he said to me, he said, well, you know, look, I'm a small firm. I'm not looking to hire somebody right now. But he goes, I heard uh, Nicholas is hiring. What if I, what if I call Nicholas? And I go, yeah, I, I, I would like that. And literally, <laughs> that, I mean, that was at a time when um, golf courses were being built all over the world. More than a golf course a day was opening in America wow. at that time. So it was just exploding in growth. And so Jack's son-in-law came and visited with me, hired me, originally thought I was going to go to Asia or, or somewhere maybe mm -hmm. overseas and those fell through. And so I started actually in America and uh, first three jobs I did were in Arizona. It was what was called a design coordinator. Some people called it a site coordinator, but site coordinator, but basically working for a senior architect, right? Okay. And that was instrumental for me because you're learning from experts, you know, guys that have worked for, you know, arguably the most successful golf design firm, um, at least in my lifetime, being Nicholas Design. And so there's so many people that, you know, I, I have gratitude towards that, you know, helped me and took me under their wing and helped train me up. And, uh, you know, it was really a life changing experience. Wow. Wow. Well, before we actually move on, if that's making me need to pause for a minute, sure. we should get it. We should uh, have a toast to that. Yes, I would love Paco. that. Paco. Hey. Hi. Hola. Que tienes para nosotros? Okay, que tienes? Do you know Saint Germain? Mm hmm. Saint Germain? with lime ah, and beautiful. quina. Wow. It's a special cocktail for you on the classic margarita. Thank you. Gracias. Gorgeous. Thank you very much. Gracias. Well, cheers. Cheers. Salute Thank to... you again for having me. Thank you so yeah, much. Glad to be here. Thank cheers. you. Okay, so then you started to work for Jack, and then you were maybe going to go to Asia, but then you started, went yeah, to America. Yeah, so I, I stayed in the U.S. until 04, um, and was fortunate to work on, you know, many of his more revered golf courses. Uh, Jim Leip was the senior designer, really an important figure in my life, helped train me. Mm -hmm. But it, when you work that closely with somebody, it, it's um, you become closer than just, you know, uh, co-workers and so he's really a guy other than my dad that has probably had the biggest impact on my life you know personally and professionally helped train me up and we built some great golf courses together uh, with with Nicholas Mayakama which is a top 100 golf course in America mm -hmm. May River in South Carolina and Hilton Head uh, is a fabulous uh, golf course uh, many feel that it's one of Jack's best properties we worked together at Desert Mountain Wow! and then 
And then I guess it was probably in 04, uh, Jack said, hey, you know, we have so much work in Mexico, would you consider moving to Mexico? And although I had not been to Cabo, I knew a fair amount of, about it because Jim Leip had worked here prior to, to me living here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, yeah, we'd love to do that. And so <laughs> at the time I was finishing a golf course in Delaware uh, called the Peninsula, uh, right on the Indian River Bay. Mm -hmm. And myself and my dog got in uh, my SUV and we <laughs> drove from Delaware to Cabo. And my wife and kids followed shortly after by airplane, luckily for them. But uh, it was it was a long journey, drove the whole Baja myself. And wow. I, at the time, I probably didn't speak 10 words of Spanish <laughs> when I got here. So. Uh -huh. um, but it, 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 you know, it's, cha it's changed my life. It's been such a value to me living here, uh, learning a different language, learning a different culture. Most of my, you know, many of my best friends now are from Mexico or Latin America. So it, nice. it opened a whole world uh, for me that, that I didn't have prior to living here. It's a special place. It is. Yeah. And which golf courses have you been involved with here? In Mexico, um, I did uh, renovation and redesign work at Cabo del Sol, the ocean course, which is on various top 100 lists in the world, mm -hmm. very special property. Also, Jim Leip involved in that project. Um, I worked the beginning at Kavira. I did not finish that golf course. That one slowed down in the crash of 09. Uh, I did a renovation at uh, the Arroyo and Mountain Nines at Palmilla. Uh, Clue Compestry is one called a Nicholas design, meaning Jack did not have involvement in it. The firm oh. did it. Okay. So that, that's one that I did primarily on my own, but also Chet Williams, a designer from Nicholas. We worked together on that one. And then Puerto Los Cabos, mm -hmm. uh, another beautiful piece of property. I worked on that golf course, El Dorado. Uh, when we started El Dorado, it was a public golf course that oh, then really? got, yeah, it was a public originally. Oh. And there was four holes on the ocean and then Discovery Land came in to operate it. We did a redesign, moved actually four new holes to the interior of the golf course, what's now the 16th hole. We moved out to the ocean, built that hole, I guess it would have been in 05. And you know, that entire community is really in a way not, not only did we transform that facility, but the, I, I think that golf course has had a major impact on Cabo. I oh, mean, it did. What, what was done, that changed the game it in Cabo. Did. It kind of became the, the one that all other high-end high, high -end developments were judged by and still mm -hmm. are judged by to some degree mm -hmm. and changed the marketplace here in Cabo. There had never been a golf course maintained like that in Cabo to that level. And so it was, you know, is, is related, is golf related that that project had a huge impact in Cabo and, and proud to have been involved with, with that facility. And then in mainland Mexico, I worked at Punta Mita, another uh, Four Seasons oh, resort. Wow. And I think there's uh, there's one other ho uh, five-star hotel there now that's connected to it. I worked on the second course uh, called Bahia, also with Jack Nicholas and Jim Light. Mm -hmm. And uh, my final project in Mexico was uh, uh, with many people call mine Palace, but now called Vedanta. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so they have a facility in Nuevo Vallarta and I did a, another Nicholas design golf course. So it was one that I designed on my own, but under the Nicholas banner. Wow. And so, you know, after doing all that work and there's a bunch I've left off that I was involved in in some capacity in, in 2016, as the market had rebounded and golf design, uh, you know, became, um, a little easier way to make a living. That was when I formed my company. And then the first golf course I did on my own was in the Dominican Republic. Oh, really? Yeah, so I have, you know, Latin America is not a huge golf market, but I've done a lot of work in Latin America. And and actually that one in the Dominican Republic led me to my most recent golf course I've completed, which is called La Hacienda Alcaidesa. And that is in an area referred to as Costa del Sol in the southern uh, coast of Spain, mm -hmm. very close to Gibraltar, a property that's just absolutely breathtaking mm, on the wow. Mediterranean Sea. You can look across the Mediterranean Sea seven miles and see the northern coast of Morocco, the Atlas Mountains, oh. and of course the Rock of Gibraltar is is dominating your entire view on the golf course. And uh, so that was an experience I've, you know, I'll never forget. I, I've spent 150 days in Spain in the last year, approximately, wow. uh, building that golf course. Really, a labor wow. of love. 
Wow, wow, wow. And you were named, or you were actually featured in Golf Course Architecture. Yep, just recently. Because of that. Yep, yeah, so yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy, happy to have a course in that magazine. And in our business, that, that magazine is, you know, kind of the gold standard. It uh, means everything. Yeah, it means everything. So it was important for me, and it's a property that's breathtaking. And it opened July 15th to a soft opening, meaning mm -hmm. limited play. And and then this fall, somewhere it looks like September, October, I'll go back and uh, they'll have the grand opening there. And uh, one of the premier hotel developers in Spain, a gentleman named Javier Ian, uh, is the owner of the property, has a five-star hotel going mm -hmm. into it. And it's really going to change the market, I think, much like El Dorado did here in that Costa del Sol region wow. of having a really, it's the only golf course of its type in Spain on the ocean now with a five-star hotel going in, it's it's magnificent. Wow, and you're quoted in there as saying, what did you say, that every hole on a golf course should be like a chapter in a book. Yep. No two are alike, Yep. and they should tell a different part of the story. Yep, yeah, and that's... That was um, interesting. Yeah, it's so, you know, golf design is unique that it's, it's one of the only sports where you know, the playing field or the court is different every time. In tennis, the court's always the same. Mm -hmm. Basketball, it's always the same. American football, it's always the same. Soccer, it's always the same. And so one of the neat things in golf design is that every architect does it a little bit differently. And one of, you know, my philosophy is how I like to do it is, you know, I want every hole to be unique and memorability is a very important to me. I, I, I've told people a lot, I would much rather somebody come to me after I've finished the design and say, well, oh, maybe I didn't like the fifth hole or I thought, you know, that green or that bunker was too deep. Mm -hmm. I would take that over them saying, I can't remember that hole. Ah, okay. okay. So I'd rather, not that I want every hole to be controversial, but time to time to have a little controversy in golf is good because then after the round you're having a drink, maybe one guy in the foursome or, or a girl doesn't like it, maybe the others do, and now they're having a conversation about mm -hmm. it. And, mm -hmm. and Pete Dye, one of the guys that, you know, um, has left an indelible mark on the game of golf, one of the most premier architects, certainly in my lifetime. He was the master at doing that, you know, having a few things of controversy <laughs> and it would, you know, get into golfers' heads. Uh -huh. And even a golf writer recently talked about you know, the golf course I did to Spain having what he calls sucker pins, which I take that as a compliment, <laughs> meaning it's a difficult pin. If you take it on, there's a big reward. But if you don't execute that shot correctly, there's there's a there's a consequence for that. <laughs> okay. And that consequence might be bo bogey or double bogey. Uh -huh. And so that that's fun. Part of golf that, that's fun is the consequent part of it, of being able to take on a difficult sh shot and execute it uh -huh. or not execute it and pay the price for it. Mm -hmm. And um, I try to do that on my golf courses. So how do you go about designing a golf course when you're given this blank canvas? Do you write it like a book? Do you, what are the components you look for? I, I can't even imagine how you approach that. Well, it's one of the unique, unique parts of this business is every client is different. So you, you need to understand what the client wants first. Who's the golf course for? Is it for okay. a, is it a private membership? Is it okay. a resort membership? Is it a public course? And I'm not trying to do the same thing on every property I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. as I get further in my my career, I hope they'll look at my golf courses and, and you know, not find them all the same. I think they'll see some tendencies of things I like. Mm -hmm. You know, there's kind of a recipe I have, but each golf course requires a bit of a variation to that recipe to make it work for that property and sure. for that owner. So just as an example, in the Dominican, if you would see the golf course I did there, which is a very high-end private course mm -hmm. uh, in the Dominican uh, on a site that's generally not that windy, and compared that to what I've just finished in Spain, which is a resort private golf course, meaning okay. they'll have high-end resort golfers, a local membership on a site that's extraordinarily windy. Okay. Very different. I mm -hmm. mean, what I've done, their greens are much bigger in Spain, not as much movement in them. The co that course was lended itself to being shorter, so it's not a, a super long golf course. Interesting. And, you know, you hear a lot of architects say this, and I think most of them mean it, but we're trying to, you know, build something that's fun, you know? Of course. You know, and that people enjoy playing and are excited to play it again the next time. And so, you know, I try to create features that, 
you know, they're gonna, maybe they don't master it the first time or the second time, and each time they play the golf course, they learn something different they didn't know before, and it reveals itself slowly over time. That's what the great golf courses do, right? You don't figure it all out at once. Interesting. And um, what is your, do you have a favorite golf course out there? For, well, yeah, to I do. To play or to design? Yeah, to play, <laughs> to play it, it's certainly Cypress Point um, oh. and, you know, Pebble Beach area, California. Yeah. To me, and that's the holy grail of, of golf design. The, the architect that I probably admire the most, who's no longer living, is a guy named Robert Hunter. He was there on site most every day when that was being built. And then Alice, Alistair McKenzie, who was the designer of record on that golf course, he did Augusta National, wow. Royal Melbourne, Cypress mm -hmm. Point, you know, those are, um, you know, to me, he was kind of the uh, Michelangelo of, of, of golf course design, him and Robert Hunter both. Robert Hunter doesn't get enough credit for that golf course, but he was really the guy there every day. And keep in mind, in that era back in, I guess that would have been the 30s, or they weren't traveling in airplanes. I mean, oh, they were traveling true. in steam steamships <laughs> and trains. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't as easy for them to get around like it is now for a modern architect. And mm -hmm. uh, what's neat about that golf course is not only that the property is maybe the most extraordinary uh, golf uh, course ever built, but it's clear when you look at it that somebody was standing there and knew exactly what they were doing. And, and I call wow. that a soul, you know, that golf course has got a soul. Mm -hmm. And when you see it, it's, it's one, you know, when you start coming out to the ocean holes on the back nine and you're coming down 13 and 14, and then probably the best stretch of golf in the world is 15, 16, 17 there on the ocean. I mean, your heart is jumping out of your chest. I mean, it is <laughs> is uncanny. And I just talked to some friends recently that went there and played it, and it's kind of the one to me that, that all others should be judged by. Do you have a little signature something that you put into every golf course that maybe is a secret that um, you only you know is there? Or is you there know, a signature I, I, design I, feature yeah, that so, people will know? Well, so what typically happens when a, a, a hole that gets called a signature hole, it's typically not the architect that decides that. It's typically oh. usually a par three. Okay. A, and the reason that is, is because you can capture that hole in one photograph. So if you think of yeah. you know, the Island Green at the TPC at Sawgrass, yeah. right? Many people would say that's the signature hole of that golf course. You can capture it all in one photo. Yeah. And usually the arc, you know, Jack, Jack used to say, I, you know, I want to do 18 signature holes, you know, and I would say the same thing. You <laughs> uh -huh. know, I want them all to be special. My course in Spain, the hole that I think many will think is the signature hole is the fifth hole, okay. which is a par five. That's a bit unusual. But the reason that one is so special is it plays downhill over 100 feet on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea and the rock of the Gibraltar is directly in your, your line of, oh of play when you play it. Gosh. So it's just it's just spectacular and then on a clear day you can see across to to morocco and it's just absolutely breathtaking and because it's so wow. downhill on a par five again you can capture the essence of the hole in one photo uh -huh. often you can't do that you uh -huh. may have to take two or three photos on a par five or a par four to try to capture it all in this one because it's so far downhill it's it's um you know i I've told a lot of people, I, I think it'll be the most photographed hole in Spain. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah it's pretty neat. Congratulations, yeah, so you. even more coverage. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, coverage is good. And how often do you play? Not as much as I would like anymore. If I'm lucky now and I can get out twice a month, I'm doing pretty good. Most of my friends now that, you know. Twice uh, a month? Yeah, it's not very good, right? Kurt! Yeah, I know. But I mean. Even I, I try to play once a week. I know, I, I am not there right now. And, and that's a, you know, it's a good problem to have because I'm so busy in the yes. golf design part drawing. I spend an extraordinary amount of time on mm -hmm. site when I'm building golf courses. Other than Cyprus in that area, do you have a favorite country that you like to play? You know, some people love the, you know, Ireland or Scotland, yeah. just because of the whole, the, the climate even yeah. that plays into that. Yeah, cer certainly the, you know, the UK, uh, other than the US, probably has the highest density of great golf courses. Mm -hmm. The neat thing that's happened in America is a lot of the best golf courses, let's say of the last hundred years have been built in the last 20 years. Oh. And okay. really the golf design market has changed a lot. It was dominated, you know, 20, even 20 years ago, primarily by bigger name architects, guys that had a name like a Jack Nicholas or an Arnold Palmer, mm -hmm. right, that were professional golfers. And you still have that many good firms like that. But the market's changed now where, you know, 
a guy like a Gil Hance or a Tom Doak who wasn't a professional golfer, but they just built really good golf courses. Mm -hmm. And the market now is hiring guys like that. And, you know, hopefully I'll be, you know, in that distinguished group as my career uh, career moves on, but I think they see the value of an architect who it's his craft. He takes a lot of time. He, sp he spends a lot of time on site. Mm -hmm. And that's to me how you take a golf course that could be good and you make it great is, is there's not a way to do it on plans. That's mm -hmm. just a starting point. But the great golf course is what they all have in common is somebody that knew what they were doing mm -hmm. was out on that site when it was being built. And it's a pretty short window of when that's happening, right? It's not, they don't take five years to build, right? How long? I mean, it depends where, but in, in Mexico here, it was often about two years. In America, with a lot of the best construction companies in the world there and access to you know all the machinery that you need, if there's something that breaks, you can get the parts right away. Mm -hmm. We, you know, You can literally build them in five months. I mean, not including the growing, but even in Spain, wow. I built an 1800 or uh, 18 hole golf course and it was built between primarily between April and August. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So we had, <laughs> That's fast. Yeah, we had three of the, the best contractors in Spain. They were all on that property trying to get it built quickly. And uh, then, you know, the growing started uh, late that summer and then mm -hmm. it's still establishing now. And by, you know, by the end of this summer, it'll be, you know, 100% and, wow. and um, should be at a very good level. What's your favorite part when you're designing the golf course? Like I have a favorite part when I'm doing the magazine. Yeah. So that's a great question. The The part I like is everyone is different. And I'm a person, my wife loves doing puzzles. I hate doing puzzles. <laughs> but what I do in golf design is a lot like a puzzle. I was like just going to say, it seems exactly like it's a puzzle. It's exactly like a puzzle. <laughs> it's exactly like a puzzle, but because I have some weird thing with me where my you know life revolves around golf um i love that part of it mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of this uh this search to figure out the best way to do it and literally i'll you know i'll be trying to go to sleep at night and my brain it's almost <laughs> like if you remember the old slides with photos you know we'd watch on a teleprompter uh -huh. and i'm just seeing pictures in my head of how i want to do it you know, and, wow. and it's and I can't even turn my brain off because it's trying to figure out the best way to do it. And when you do it, it's permanent, right? Uh -huh. So there's this yeah. pressure. Hey, I got one <laughs> shot to do this. And then if you're lucky, maybe in 20 years, they have to do a renovation. You mm -hmm. get to touch it once more. And most golf architects like to tinker, you mm -hmm. know, and say, hey, I think I can improve that and change that a little bit. Uh -huh. And but there's a lot of pressure to get it right the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, during that process, it's such a creative process. It's very often it's hard for me to turn turn my mind off because it's working so hard to figure out the best solution to get the best golf design I can. How fun. How fun. Now, I don't know if they told you, but on the Mod Pod, on Mod Pod with Bukunaga, we always have a Mod Pod experience. Okay. So it's a little game. Okay. They're always different and they're tailored to the individual. All right, perfect. <laughs> I'm starting to laugh already, people. Do you like movies? I do. I do too. Do yeah. you like movies that have some golf in it? I certainly. I think I've seen most all of those. Okay. Yep. Everybody, did you hear that? He yep. said he's seen most all yep. of them. Okay. So we will see Testing my memory. how this goes. <laughs> okay. So I have some famous movie yep. scenes. Yep. And it sounds like you're probably going to get all of them correct. I don't know. Now I'm getting um, nervous. Here you go. Okay. You just match your the golf course with this scene. Okay. All right. All right. Let's if see we if had I can a do timer. This. Oh man, some of these are more obscure <laughs> ones than I thought. I know. Uh, I think some are going to be yeah, hard. I was okay. hoping Caddyshack, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the Caddyshack one I can get. Okay, that's that's Bob, Bobby June. Oh, I think, oh, there. Lupita's being very, oh. very generous oh, with a minute easy. and a half. Okay. Oh man. All right. All right. So. So I think we have in here Caddyshack Tin Cup. Yeah, I, think, I think I don't see the tin cup. Oh, I got to put the stickers on. So yeah, this one goes yeah. to Bobby this Jones. This one goes to this one. This All one right. is definitely uh, Kevin Costner and tin cup. Uh huh. Okay. Oh, man, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. <laughs> oh, that one's Adam Sandler. I know that one. Happy Gilmore. Happy Gilmore. I think Babe Zaharias in that photo. Oh my gosh, how do you know all these? 
That's oh, Caddyshack. Happy, Gil Happy Gilmore's okay, up there. Okay, yeah, there's Happy Gilmore. Here's Put that Caddyshack. One on there. Here's Caddyshack here. Okay, this is Happy Gilmore? Yep, this one is Legend of Bagger Bands. Okay, that's at the top here. Yep. Got Ooh, it. Goldfinger. I'm thinking that's Goldfinger, Goldfinger right there. Had a, Goldfinger had some golf in it? Yeah. Oh, here's Tin Cup. We finally found Tin okay, Cup. Okay, I got that one, Where's right? Tin Cup, Band the of, picture? I'll put uh, that on. Oh, here's Bagger Bands. Oh, uh -oh. man, that's too much. I needed three minutes. <laughs> that's okay, that's, that's okay. Now, does your yep. whole family play golf? They don't, actually. My wife has played a little bit when we were younger. My daughter was a very good golfer, played competitively growing up. She oh my was gosh. very gifted. She did not have that gene that I have where it's all she thinks about. Mm -hmm. um, but she still plays, and occasionally we play together. She loves it. My son tried it for a little bit, kind of wasn't wasn't for him and I'm okay with that. I mean, we're all different and yeah. so I, I hope my kids can find their passion like I found mine and if, if they can make a living in that even better or do it in their part time. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to be one of the people that get to do what I love and make a living doing it and that doesn't happen all that often. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't forget that. Yeah, you are very, very fortunate. Not yep. very many people get to actually do what they love. That's right. And I, I'm a staunch believer that golf and poker, yes. but golf and poker yep. teaches the most amazing life lessons. 100%. Perseverance, yes. um, uh, confidence, yep. uh, you know, when you, uh, d d d self control, yep. um, honor. Yep. And you can ethics. and you can learn so much about a person in four hours on a golf oh course. Oh my right? gosh. I mean, if you really want to figure out what a person is about, in a short period of time, there's no better golf. place to do it than golf because, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like life is, but boiled down into four hours. So there's, you know, good breaks and there's bad breaks. Honor. And honor. Honesty. Exactly. So you can find out a lot about a person playing golf a hundred percent. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I th and I think poker does the same yeah. thing, but also you're the only one that can get you out of it. That's Nobody right. can help you. That's right. So you have to figure out how to play through, how to get, you know, keep it going. Yep. I That's love exactly the game. Right. The, the thing that I regret is I didn't start younger. I understand that. It's a harder sport to start later, but I know you get to out, get out and play a lot of golf now, and I admire that because it's difficult when you start later in life, and I think a lot of people are very intimidated by that, and I think it's one of the things we in the golf business have to do a better job of is trying to get more ladies into golf, um, starting, you know, if we can at a younger age, because mm -hmm. once, it, once you start it, as you know, uh, you get hooked on it. Many people do, like you and oh, I do. I'm obsessed. Yeah, you get obsessed by it, and it's uh, to me unlike any other sport in that that regard. And you know, I try to explain it to people sometimes, where I almost feel like I didn't choose golf; it was like chose me. I mean, like <laughs> I, there's plenty of times in my life I've thought, well, you know, why couldn't I have loved, you know, finance or or something else? And all all uh -huh. I think about is, you know, golf. I mean, uh -huh. it's on my TV all the time. It's the way my mind is wired. I guess it's you know almost like an addiction. And you know I have friends in the business like that, and I have friends out of the business that make their living doing other things. Mm -hmm. But their passion and you know life is a hobby called golf. And so it's it's unique that way. It's unique that you can play it your entire life. I know the, that too. Yep. Yeah. And um, all the people I've met because of golf is remarkable. I mean, um, and um, the bond that you build through golf, right? I mean, it, it lasts. It lasts 100%. And so I, I was talking to a friend recently. It, as much as I love going around and being able to play some of the best golf courses in the world and work on the design of many of them, at its core, if you asked me how to, you know, spend a, a day golf, and I would go back with my best friends that I grew up with, and I'd go play a little public course in o Ohio where I grew up. Mm -hmm. My friend's the superintendent there called Zor Village Golf Course, and another friend of mine, a guy named Jim Steiner, lives nearby, and, like, that's my perfect day. You're with your, you know, kind of best friends forever, that's and you fun. spend a day together. And so it doesn't have to be as many great golf courses as we, as we have in Cabo and as I've got to, to build, uh -huh. it doesn't have to be at a, you know, a golf course that costs 30 million to build for it mm -hmm. to be enjoyable, right? I, I mean, agree. you can play golf courses that were cheap to build, cheaper to maintain, 
and um, have just as much fun doing that. But that's another neat part of golf is there's, you know, golf courses with extraordinary budgets and, and, you know, Augusta comes to mind when you think of that, but I admire very much because they kind of embody uh, that pursuit of excellence and mm -hmm. perfection, right? And it's one of the few places in life, and, and this isn't coming from me, it's from other people that have been there often how you view something is set up by what your expectations are before you got there, right? Of course. And when your expe expectations are very high, it could be the, eat the same at a restaurant, and you go eat there and you're kind of like, well, I didn't live up to my expectations, mm -hmm. right? Well, no matter how high your expectations are, if you go to the master's tournament, I've never met anybody that's came back from that and was not just wow. mind boggled oh, and wowed by it, right? Uh -huh. And so, so that can be admired, but it also can be admired, you know, these superintendents that don't have a big budget that are maintaining these golf courses or architects that are working on smaller budgets, trying to make golf as fun as they can and enjoyable. And so, you know, whether I'm doing a golf course for a, you know, a development that's, uh, you know, got a big budget and it's, you know, got a five-star hotel or one that, you know, could be a municipal golf course, mm -hmm. The enjoyment for me is the same because at the end of the day, you know, I want golfers to come there and have a good time playing it and then want to come back and play it again the next day. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I think about that when I'm golfing. Even if I mess up, I never get frustrated. I just think, oh, I've got another shot. Right. I just want the next time. And that's what makes it right. fun because right. every stroke is different. You're yeah. never typically going to hit it in the exact same spot. The climb is not going to be the same. Yeah. Everything is different. That's right. And it's like a poker hand. Yeah. Every single round is different. Is different. Every yeah. card that, that comes down on. Yeah. And often even when you're having that bad day, you'll get to the last hole and you'll hit your best shot of the day. And then you're so excited again for the next round, right? It keeps you're me like, going. Yeah, it keeps you going. You're like, I want to play another 18 now that I did that. And it keeps me going. That, that golf is different that way. I mean, the feeling when my son started playing, I said, to me, the feeling of a perfectly struck golf shot is unlike anything else I ever had in sports, oh, you know? That sound. that sound, that feel that you get, oh, the reward that, that you it. feel for doing that, it's, it's, uh, it's very unique. And I think that's why people get hooked on golf is, is that sensation of doing that. And because it's a hard sport. I mean, like if you never played it and you watched it on TV for an hour, you'd probably think, hey, and you know, I could go out tomorrow and figure that out, and then you go try to do it the first time, and you oh, can't. Oh, it's ridiculous! You cannot believe how hard it is, right? Exactly. And um, <laughs> and so that's part of the charm of golf is it's so hard to conquer, and you see a lot of pro athletes come from other sports mm -hmm. when they retire, especially yes. right, mm -hmm. and they start playing, and they're hooked on it, and I think they, you know, some of that uh, time they had playing professionally and the challenge of doing that and then i think that transfers over to golf for sure good because they get that rush for winning that they have playing in in sports etc and so a lot of athletes come from other sports and enjoy going into into golf and playing it especially during their career or after their mm -hmm. career and it's fun for us to i love to watch uh, uh, professional athletes from another sport come yeah, and play golf yeah i don't know i think it's really amazing yeah obviously if they're mastering Yep. two or more sports. Yeah, so. and, and when I, I've been fortunate to play with a few, you know, professional athletes, and mm -hmm. it's amazing, you know, when they're that good of an athlete, how quickly they can pick up golf, right? Yeah. Baseball players especially, they know where the club face is, they're athletic already, mm -hmm. they can pick it up relatively quick. Hockey players is probably the easiest sport to transition into golf. A lot of hockey players are very good golfers. A lot of baseball pitchers are very good golfers. Um, and so, those, it, you know, that's that's, that's the thing, growing up, if you can learn other sports, mm -hmm. um, I, I just heard Cameron Young talking about this, who finished second in the British Open. He played a lot of sports growing up, yeah. hockey being one of them, and his mm -hmm. dad is a, an instructor, and he talked about how, you know, him being athletic and learning different sports has helped him in golf, as opposed to just focusing on golf yeah. when he was younger. I don't think there's a right or wrong. Some people focus on it very early, some play other sports. But I think certainly being an athlete and, and um, you know, playing other sports, the hand-eye coordination, it translates to mm -hmm. golf. Tennis players are another one mm -hmm. that they can transfer from it. Yvonne Lendl was a member at a course that I, that I uh, had worked on a, a few years ago uh, with Robert Trent Jones Jr. And um, he's a great golfer. Interesting, and he, I didn't he know was that. A, you know, obviously a great tennis player as well. So. 
Um, yeah, hand-eye coordination in golf, as you know, is a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll continue to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> so let's wrap up today. Let's see how well you did. Okay. Probably with every single one right now. I can't... I'm afraid. No. no, I think you did. Yeah. Hold on. What does that say? Lost in translation. Lost in translation. Did I get that one right or no? I don't think I, don't I missed think that one. Yeah, that okay. one's gone. All right, that was a goner. My favorite brunette. No. no. <laughs> Over two. This is not good. No, why? Because you know I put the hard ones at the at the on the top. The greatest game ever played. Yep. Yes. All right, and I got that. Okay. Oh, Lost in Translation. No, you know no. what this one? This Golf was Golf in the, in the Kingdom. I don't okay. know that movie. Oh, see, I messed this one up. This was one. That this one is Happy I had Gilmore. Right. That's Happy Gilmore. That That's Happy Gilmore. One. You know that. Oh, I, I took That's this one. Bagger Vance. That's Bagger Vance. I would have got that Vance. one right. This That's one Tin we know. Cup. I got that yes. right. Yes. Now I'm getting into oh, the Oh, there ones. we go. What's that one? That's uh, that's James Bond. I oh, think I got that one right. Oh, the Goldfinger one. Yeah. Yep, I got yeah. that one. All right, that's good. All right. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, that was me. I put that on wrong. Was that Bagger Vance? I don't think that might be the greatest game. Was that the greatest game? Yes. No, yeah. no. This was Bobby Jones, A Stroke of Genius. Oh, I should have got that. I don't know. I've seen that one. Okay, or I've seen part I, of that. I don't maybe. think I've seen that one. Uh, that's Caddyshack. Yes, right? I messed that up. Yep. I, on that Your sidekick on the game yeah. and didn't do very missed, well. I think I missed four of them, and I'm not a, I will say I'm not a big movie guy. Um, Your but, sidekick messed up, messed it up. That's not bad. That's not bad, yeah. but it makes me, it has, there are a couple of movies in here now I have to go see. Same. Right? Yeah, I didn't even know about those. <laughs> well, yep. thank you so much yeah, for coming. Thank you for this having This was me. really informative and yep. fun. Thank you so much. I could talk about here. golf all day long. I could. We'll talk more about it tonight. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Salud. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming yep, and join us to see all of your Mod Pod with Fukunaga episodes on all your favorite podcast channels. Thank you. Thank you. Salut. Thanks for listening to Mod Pod with Fukunaga. Follow the episodes on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and many more.